This afternoon, in our consecutive exposition of all 150 psalms, we come in the series to the 56th psalm, which I've entitled, A God for the Fearful. I want to start out with a, a question to stimulate your thinking. Is the God of the Bible... God for the strong, brave, smart, good, and capable people of this world? Or is he rather God for the weak, the fearful, the confused, the guilty, and the needy? Well, I think it's very counterintuitive for us to open our Bibles and wonder of wonders discover that he is a God for the latter kind of people. That is, for people like us. God for weak people, guilty people, needy people, fearful people, frail people. You know, um, <clears throat> this is uh, illustrated for us in the 56th Psalm, but the idea is stated very explicitly, for example, in a passage like 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where we read... Verse 26, you see your calling, brethren, being addressed to Christians, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and, and base or lowly things of the world and things which are despised has God chosen, yes, and things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no flesh will glory in his presence. And uh, another passage that's relevant is James 4, the second part of verse 6, which says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. In the Goliath story, the famous story of David and Goliath, David seems the epitome of manly courage. You know, he, he's so uh, attractive as a man, a young man in the story, so, um, so, so victorious. He seems so confident. He can almost get a, a contract for Nike sneakers or something. But really, if you read the story closely, you discover that David was not inherently brave. He was a fearful man trusting God. God was his courage, in effect. 1 Samuel chapter 17 uh, is describing those moments just before the famous confrontation on the battlefield. And David uh, is expressing his, his feelings in these words. The Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. This is the furthest thing from self-confidence on David's part. He had rather trusted in the Lord Almighty to save him in other precarious situations. And he had seen God at work to deliver him uh, faithfully. And so with confidence in God rather than himself, he figures God is big enough to deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine as well. The psalm title of Psalm 56 says, it is to the chief musician upon... Jonath Elam Rehokim, um, Mictum of David, when the Philistines took him in Gath. Now, that's an elaborate psalm title compared to most of the others. I think it includes that a, a tune name that might have been familiar to the ancients, which we don't know now. But the last part is what I would uh, focus upon. When it says, the psalm is 
written in connection with the time that the Philistines took David in Gath. When the Lord did not embolden David, he was as fearful as any other person would be. And we read of a shameful time in his life, really, when he acted that way. First Samuel 21 is might be the very incident the psalm title refers to. And it's not so familiar with to us as the Goliath story. So let me just read those six verses. 1 Samuel 21, 10. And David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said unto him, Is not this David the king of the land? Did they not sing one to another of him in dances, saying, Saul hath slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands? And David laid up these words in his heart, and was sore afraid of the king of Gath, Achish. Uh, That's a little uh, quaint to say he was sore afraid. The margin says, It means he was greatly or extremely afraid. And if if we didn't uh, understand what that means, we see how fearful he was in his behavior. Verse 13, And he changed his behavior before them and feigned himself mad in their hands. That is, insane. And scrabbled or made marks on the doors of the gate and let his spittle fall down upon his beard. Then said Achish unto his servants, Lo, ye see the man is mad. Wherefore then have ye brought him to me? Have I need of madmen that ye brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? So shall this fellow come into my house? Now this is startling this is this is uncharacteristic behavior to say the least in david but he was extremely afraid here and maybe maybe you've been so afraid you've done something like this he pretended to be insane scratching marks on the what does it say on the door and letting the spit run down his beard like like he didn't have all his marbles. And it was an act. It was just an act. I suppose he thought that they were about to kill him, but if he appeared like no threat, but rather an object of, of, of pity, he could save his own life. That is taking an extreme measure, and it is a, a bizarre manifestation of extreme fear on this occasion. In the wake of what happened here, I think it was that Psalm 56 was written. David wrote this psalm uh, afterward, it seems. And in the meditation, prayer, and song of Psalm 56, his, his faith and his courage rose again as he meditated on his great God who had delivered him not only from the lion And from the bear, but now also from the Philistine Goliath, the giant. In other words, if I could summarize the message of Psalm 56, the Lord is a God for the fearful. The Lord is a God for the fearful. Are you a fearful person? Good, because now you're qualified to have the Lord as your Lord and your God. Um, Let's... uh, Let's read, read the psalm then in its entirety without comment in preparation for the exposition. I'll, I'll omit the title since I've read it already. <clears throat> Be merciful unto me, O God, for man would swallow me up. He fighting daily oppresseth me. Mine enemies would daily swallow me up. For they be many that fight against me, O Thou Most High. What time I am afraid, I will trust in Thee. In God I will praise His Word. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. 
Every day they rest my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They gather themselves together. They hide themselves. They mark my steps when they wait for my soul. Shall they escape by iniquity? In thine anger cast down the people, O God. Thou tellest my wanderings. Put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? When I cry unto thee, then shall mine enemies turn back. This I know, for God is for me. In God will I praise his word. In the Lord will I praise his word. In God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid what man can do unto me. Thy vows are upon me, O God. I will render praises unto thee. For thou hast delivered my soul from death. Wilt thou not deliver my feet from falling? that I may walk before God in the light of the living. Amen? Amen. Amen. The Lord's Word. The Roman poet that lived uh, just barely into the first century A.D. said, Whoever lives in fear will never be a free man. It's a truism. Fear has bondage, Scripture says. Has torment. Um... Many people have given themselves over to the study of human, the human condition and human thoughts and feelings and conduct and, and uh, have cataloged many things about this. And I consulted some of these experts and I learned about symptoms and effects of extreme fear. And this isn't a matter of uh, anything particularly theological, but more of human observation. When someone is suffering an extreme fear, symptoms include inability to concentrate, decreased occupational functioning, increased heart rate, difficulty breathing or hyperventilating, irritability and agitation, muscle tension, broken sleep patterns, feelings of being overwhelmed, racing thoughts, and constantly feeling on edge. Not a nasty list. I feel like I'm more afraid now having read it. And then the symptoms, I mean, the effects of such fear, debilitating fear, can include these things. Social impairment, decrease in academic or occupational functioning. In other words, you can't study and you can't do your work to some extent. Relationship problems, missed school and work, substance use. Inability to adjust to change, self-injury, even suicidal thoughts and attempts. Fear is a powerful, powerful experience in its extreme uh, measures. A psalm like this, however, can be a great practical help. And uh, I pray that it will be to us. Well, uh, different uh, students of the psalm, uh, like me, have... Divided it up in different ways, but um, I think that fear is a uh, dominant theme in the psalm, that God is the God of the fearful. And so with that theme in mind, I've given you five, five points that analyze the psalm in, in order from the first to the last verse. First of all, uh, the psalm tells us about the reason for fear uh, in verses 1 and 2. Then... The psalmist's recourse in fear, then his principled resistance to fear, then his recovering from fear, and finally his rejoicing after the fear. Uh, That's the way I would outline it. So, uh, reason for fear in the beginning of the psalm. Uh, This is where he prays, be merciful or be gracious to me, O God, for man would swallow me up. And he describes these human Enemies he he has. Uh, First thing in the prayer. When he was praying, David did not artificially put on a brave face, but he admitted his distress and and the reasons for it. Uh, Not just reasons that pertain to his feelings, but reasons in objective situational reality. And we've seen this as a trait of the Psalms uh, from the beginning. They're real. They're the nitty gritty of true human experience in this fallen world. There's no 
sugarcoating things here. Um, it has often been said, denial ain't a river in Egypt. And denial ain't spiritual either. I, I'm, I, I think there are some that imagine when they come to pray, they have to pretend everything's fine in God's presence if they're going to pray in a spiritual manner. Far from it. Especially in our private prayers. The Lord invites us to pour out our hearts to Him. And if we follow the pattern that's everywhere in the Psalms, that is rugged honesty. God, I don't, I'm so afraid. This is what's happening. Uh, my enemies are all around me. They're out to get me. This is the kind of real talk that characterizes the Psalms. Um, David acknowledged then his real human enemies. And he, he says a number of things about them. For one thing, they're extremely malicious. You know, they're not just trying to make me feel unhappy. He says, man would swallow me up. Uh, that's that's uh, a graphic uh, metaphor for their malicious intent. They want to eat. They want to to kill him. In effect, to destroy him, and it's compared to a, a monster that just consumes its prey. Um, he says furthermore that his enemies are relentless. Uh, it says in verse one that the, this enemy is fighting daily. And uh, it says in verse 2, Mine enemies would daily swallow me up. And this idea of daily is again in verse 5. Every day they rest my words. I consulted other translations and um, a common approach to the translation would be to, instead of putting daily, put all day long. Which is a, an effective way to portray their relentless opposition to me. All day long, they never let up. They never give me a break. They're always working against me and out to get me. Constantly. And of course, that's part of what wears them down and makes them afraid. I, I, I have to be vigilant at all times because they're always working to kill me. He says further about his enemies that they are they are powerful enemies. They oppress me, or it has been translated, trample me, or persecute me. And there are also many of them. He says in verse two, they be many that fight against me, O thou most high. If there if you had one mortal enemy that was trying to track you down and assassinate you, that would be one thing. But if you had an army against you, of course that's much scarier. And yet, by faith, David knew that he was in God's care. And that was the basis for, for courage. He calls God here the merciful, uh, by implication. Be merciful or gracious to me. He's not presumptuous that he has this coming to him just by virtue of who he is. He asks for mercy and humbly petitions the Lord for it. And he calls God furthermore in verse 2, O thou most high. So this is the whole biblical theology. The, the pious mind is humble and knows its weakness, knows its vulnerability confesses that before the Lord and also has confidence in God because God is gracious and God is almighty. So David knew that he, David, was sinful and weak, but also that God is compassionate and omnipotent. So with, with God on your side, that God on your side, you, you, you're safe and you will prove victorious at last. And this is how and why David went on to do great things. Um, Daniel chapter 11, 32 uh, states the principle generally. It says, those people who know their God shall be strong and do exploits. It's the wonderful King James translation. Those people who know their God shall be strong and do exploits. David knew his God. 
And so he proved a, a man of accomplishment for the sake of the kingdom of God. He, he had reason to fear and he was fearful in himself, but he knew his God. And this was his saving grace. So the psalm begins by acknowledging the legitimate reasons for fear. There are many deadly, malicious, relentless human enemies that are out to get me. And so I make my appeal to you, God the merciful, God the gracious, God the almighty. Uh, we move then, progressing through the psalm, to the next part, starting with verse 3, where we see the psalmist's recourse in prayer. Um, it is uh, um, a certain writer that said, the time of fear is the time to trust. And uh, we see that here in this passage. Yes, it was a time of fear in David's life, but he resorts to the Lord. He knew that this is the time of faith. Uh, faith, is, faith in God is always seasonable, but it's desperately needed in times of overwhelming fear, like David had faced. And uh, the, the, the very uh, words of verse 3 in the King James Version are so beautifully poetic, practically, when it says, What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Uh, the New King James puts it a little bit more mundanely when it says, when I am afraid. But it's the idea that whenever the time of provocation to fear comes, that is the time when I will trust in the Lord. This is his resolve. Um, and then he, he says, I will trust in thee, in God, in God I have put my trust. Emphatically stating both his righteous purpose and his righteous action. Here's what I intend to do. I intend to trust in the Lord. And then he testifies, I have trusted in the Lord, which is to say I am trusting him. This is what we need to do when we are afraid to trust in the Lord. Uh, we need to have faith in God as our deliverer, our savior. Now, someone might start to think very theologically and, and have the idea, but Pastor Meadows, isn't faith, this kind of saving faith, this kind of comforting faith in a Christian, isn't that faith itself a gift of God's grace? You can't just decide in your own strength or from your own inclination apart from God at work in you to have faith and to exercise faith like this, can you? Well, no, that's true. However, the fact that faith is a gift of grace does not make it less our act and our responsibility. Uh, faith is a duty on our part, and to fail to trust God is a sin, a sin of unbelief. And so just because the faith to trust God is a gift of His grace does not imply that we're not responsible to exercise faith or that it's not something that we ourselves do when we trust in the Lord. Well, next we see in this second part the effect of faith. When David says in particular, I will not fear what flesh can do to me. Uh, this is a wonderful use of language, the the word flesh basically means uh, human beings. It's a reference to his human enemies. But by using the word flesh, he in implies that these enemies of mine have their limitations. They're not almighty. They're not eternal. They're not invincible. They're just flesh. That is, they're just, just human beings. Whereas... The one on my side is spirit, that is God, the immutable, the invisible, the eternal, the almighty, the invincible one, the one who is infinitely superior to all his enemies. Flesh, in other words, signals limitation of the threat. Yes, they're a real threat, but they're a limited threat because I have God on my side. God who is not flesh. Um, one translation by modern 
um, by modern scholars says, what can mortals do to me? Uh, the passage that we might compare with this, which came to my mind, is Isaiah 31, verse 3. Uh, that emphasizes this limitation of a human threat. It says, Now the Egyptians are men and not God, and their horses are flesh and not spirit. When the Lord shall stretch out His hand, both he that helps shall fall, and he that is helped shall fall down, and they shall all fail together. You know, the contrast is between the Lord, who is infinite, eternal, deity and the Egyptians and their horses which are just flesh they're just mortal beings and uh, remembering that gives David confidence my savior is divine and my enemies are only human uh, and even if if and, and the fact is our enemies are sometimes superhuman they're demonic and the devil himself but even the demons and the devil are mere creatures under God's sovereign control. When it comes to the Lord and the, the, the confidence faith in Him begets, we read in Psalm 118 verse 6, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? This is exalting in being protected by the Lord Himself. Now, now this doesn't, when it says, I will not fear what flesh can do to me, notice, it's the same psalm where He says, what time I am afraid, I will trust in Thee. It's not to deny that He feels fear. When He says, I won't fear what flesh can do to me, it doesn't necessarily mean that all fear is completely gone, but... I think what it's fair enough to say is it means that fear does not any longer absolutely rule me or paralyze me like it did before. Somebody wrote a book entitled, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. Great title. And I think, really, that is the noblest bravery. The, the most brave people are not the people who feel no fear whatsoever, but those who feel the fear and do what is right anyway. To be utterly devoid of fear in real danger is to be out of touch with reality, isn't it? Yes. You know, someone we would think is not completely right if they, if they feel no fear whatsoever in, in potentially fatal circumstances. So the time for faith is, is especially when we feel the fear. We ought to resolve to trust in the Lord and then we will have uh, courage that was not there before. Enough courage to rise above fear and do the right thing. Before we leave the second part of this, his recourse in fear, I want to show you the basis for such faith. And it is the Word of God. This is in the first line of verse 4 where he says, I will praise His Word. That is God's Word. Um, now whether this was a reference originally to already written scriptures or to prophetic words that came to David, I'm not sure. Maybe both. But for us, the Word of God is... Uh, uh, which is a foundation for our faith, is the written word in Holy Scripture. Uh, and I want you to notice that while God's word is distinguished from God, they're also so closely associated that the psalmist says, I praise God and I praise His word. In the end of the psalm, he says, verse 12, I will render praises unto thee. And in verse 4 he says, I will praise his word. And uh, that, that phrase, I will praise his word, occurs three times. It's in verse 4, uh, twice. I'm sorry, it's in verse 4, and it's in verse 10, uh, twice. In God, I will praise his word. In the Lord, I will praise his word. 
Uh, in verse 11, it could be rendered, I will render praises unto thee. You know, people like us, and I mean by that, true Christians, not only now, but through the centuries, are people that have implicit faith in Scripture as God's Word. We believe that what Scripture says, God says. And uh, this is what the Bible itself teaches. Um, in fact, Scripture isn't just what God said. Scripture is what God says now. Hebrews chapter 3 quotes one of the Psalms and says, The Holy Spirit says, present tense. That's why there's such a close association of the Scriptures with God Himself. And we have been ridiculed as bibliolaters by those who have a low view of Scripture, who do not identify Scripture with the very words of God Almighty speaking to us in each generation in a living way. That's a false charge. We do not worship the Bible, but we worship the God of the Bible. And when the Bible speaks, God speaks. And how would God's word not be praiseworthy? Of course it is. As we see the psalmist had a high view of God's word here. And that is the basis for our faith in God, primarily. You know, it says in Romans 10, verse 17, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In the popular usage, the word hope means basically um, an uncertain uh, desire that things would turn out well at last. But this is not generally the way the Bible uses the word hope. Christian hope is not wishful thinking. It's really fact-based knowledge about the certain future outcome of things Knowledge which rests on verbal revelation of God's grace to those who are trusting him. Uh, that is particularly the gospel promise. And so nothing is more certain than God's word. I am a believer. I believe in God. I trust in the Lord. I believe the Bible is the word of God. So in my mind, I'm telling you, uh, when I when I preach to you about judgment day and about who will be saved and who will perish it's as certain to me as if it's already happened because this is what God announces is going to happen. Do you have that kind of faith and hope? I hope you do. I hope you do. It's not, it's, it's not, a, it's not a, it's not a, like some kind of a clue about what's likely to happen. We have God telling us what shall happen before it happens. And therefore, it's as good as done already. There's no uncertainty whatsoever about it if it's indeed what God announces shall happen in the future. So, you know, the, the Christians, the real Christians, will be saved on the last day. Unquestionably so. We know that already. We know for sure that's going to happen. That's Christian hope. Well, we come now to the third, what I call the third part of the psalm, and that is the psalmist's deliberate resistance to fear. And I would characterize these verses, 5 to 9, as a workout of the soul exercising faith. Okay, so faith is something that the soul uh, does, and it it. it it exercises faith in the confession of things that are true about God and our relationship to Him and God's relation as well to, to, to our enemies and to us. We see things from God's point of view and we, we say they're true and real on the basis of faith. So that's what the psalmist is doing in the middle of the psalm. He recalls the problem. Now, now think about the progression. First in the psalm prayer, he says, Lord, I have many enemies. Then he says, when I'm afraid, I'll trust in you and I won't be afraid um, about what people are going to do to me. And then he goes back to rehearsing the problem again. He recalls the problem. Every This is verse 5. Every day they rest or twist my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. That means to hurt me, for trouble, for calamity. 
They gather themselves together. They're hiding out. They're marking my steps. They're waiting for me for their opportunity to come and hurt me. Well, wait a minute. I thought you just said you, you weren't afraid of what flesh can do to you, David. Well, he did say that. But he knows that the serious threat against him remains regardless of how he feels. And so so it's, it's not a lack of faith to admit the problem even after we have some deliverance from fear. And then he remembers God's justice in verse 7. Now, uh, the translation uh, is... Um, possibly uh, could possibly be different than it is here in ours i'm not saying there's anything wrong with the way the king james renders verse 7 it says shall they escape by iniquity um but it could also be um stated as a question uh they shall not I, i'm sorry as a as a declarative they shall not escape with what they do. I found a paraphrase that gives it this way, and I think this helps us understand the logic of it. With the wrong they do, can they escape? In other words, as there is a just God in heaven, and these evil people are are wrongfully persecuting me, God is noting their misdeeds, and God will certainly bring them to their deserved ruin. And he pronounces then a, an imprecatory uh, a curse upon them. In verse 7, he says, it's really a prayer request. In thine anger, cast down the people, O God. That is, these wicked people. Those kind of statements in the Psalms bother some people, but they shouldn't because the psalmist is looking ahead to Judgment Day, ultimately, and he knows that, that there will be wicked wicked sinners before God's judgment throne on Judgment Day. And he knows that they are certain to be uh, condemned and cast down and sent to their eternal punishment. And so knowing that is what God's plan is, it's not a sin in the psalmist to pray that it would happen. That's to be in sync with God himself. He doesn't say this from any personal spite, but out of a zeal for God's glory and righteousness to prevail. And then, I think uh, in the psalm, this might be the most um, beautiful, heart-touching passage, which is in verse 8. He, he revels in God's love for him in this passage. Thou tellest or numberest my wanderings. Put my tears in your bottle are they not all in your book? That's the way the New King James renders the passage. It's beautiful language. It's figurative, but it's beautiful all the same. It is essentially to, to acknowledge that though God is the high and lifted up creator and the ruler of the universe, nevertheless, this God transcendent notes our suffering with, with sympathy and purpose to deliver us. That is, that God, God is completely cognizant of uh, what His dear, beloved people suffer. And He is love itself. And He is also justice. And when His plan comes to a full development and fruition, there will be uh, nothing but grace for His chosen people. And nothing but justice, hell to pay for those who have proven to be their inveterate, impenitent enemies. It's, 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 look, it's as if God has a bottle for each believer. And when you shed a tear, God preserves that tear in his bottle. It's as if God has a journal and he's writing down the story of your life. And when you've had a terrible day... He, he, he notes it and, and never forgets it. And uh, he will more than make up for these things in your life by his grace. Uh, in the classic commentary on the Psalms called The Treasury of David, mostly by Spurgeon, he cites another writer named Robert Hawker on this passage who said, 
What a sweet thought is suggested here of God's remembrance of his people's affliction. It is an interesting figure of speech of bottling their tears, but the sense is they are remembered. And woe will be to the man that offends one of God's little ones on this account. What are now bottles of tears will be poured out in the end as so many vials of wrath. Wow. Wonderful sentiment from Robert Hawker. All right, well, moving right along. The reason for fear comes before recourse in fear, and then we have the resistance to fear. In verses, the last line of verse 9, and then verse 10 and 11, we have the psalmist recovering from fear. And here, this is, this is where his best frame of mind is, seems to be fully restored. And it says, This I know, for God is with me. Now, the rest of the verses 10 and 11 sound just like what we've heard before in verse 4. The thing that's new about this, or different from what has gone before, is this line. This I know, for God is for me. What, what does he mean, this I know? Well, it, to understand that, you look at the first line of verse 9. When I cry to thee, then my enemies shall turn back. In other words, you will hear favorably and answer my cry of distress on account of my enemies. And when, when I cry to you, when I make my prayer to you, there will be an answer to that prayer. My enemies will turn back and I'll be delivered. This is what I know. And I know my enemies will be turned back or defeated in their attempt to get me because God is for me. God is for me. That is so simple. God is for me. God's not for everybody. Do you know that? But God is for fearful people who trust in Him. God is He's God for the fearful. Uh, this is this is it, in my mind. This is probably the climactic triumph of the whole psalm, when he can say, "This I know, for God is for me." It reminds me uh, of of the ending of Romans chapter eight, where there is that most triumphant celebration of the grace of God that belongs to all Christians, um, those who are in Christ Jesus, and will eventually be crowned with our full redemption from all our enemies, including our sins, so that we are perfectly conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. In that passage of Romans 8, it says, If God be for us, who can be against us? Now that doesn't mean if God is for you, that you can't have any enemies in this life. That's not what it means. Because we do. But the point rather is that while we have enemies, it doesn't matter anymore that we have enemies in terms of the outcome of the conflict. If God is for us, then what difference does it make who is against us? We have God on our side. And certainly uh, the gift of Christ and the gift of the Holy Spirit to the church uh, is the proof that God is for us. This is Paul's reasoning in Romans 8 when he says, He who spared not his own son, but delivered him, us, delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? Now with this New Testament light added to the light of Psalm 56, it strikes me that um, this is a part of the cure as much insofar as we can have a cure in this life, the cure for fear. It's not just a some kind of vague, generic trust in God that we need, but rather a trust in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. My pastoral counsel to you, if you struggle with debilitating fear from time to time, or maybe all the time, is that you should meditate on Christ crucified, and the Spirit outpoured. 
Because that should prove, if you're a believer, a powerful aid against debilitating fear. If, if you are a true Christian, you can as truly say as the psalmist himself did, God is for me. And the proof that God is for me is he gave his son for me. And he has given me his spirit to apply the redeeming benefit Christ secured for me when he died on the cross in my place. That's the proof that God is for me. I know this on the basis of gospel promise. And so if God is for me, I may have enemies, I may have fears, but they're not going to thwart God's good and gracious purpose to deliver me finally out of all trouble. And I know that he will. That's, I think, uh, a fair uh, characterization of this part of the psalm. Recovery from fear. David, by the time he got to verse uh, 9... This I know that my enemies will turn back when I call on God because God is for me. He had he had recovered from fear. Uh, He was no longer drooling down his beard and writing on the doorpost and acting like an insane man just to live. Now he was he, he was composed with faith in the Lord. Then the psalm concludes, I think, with uh, an example of his rejoicing after the fear And I say this is the topic of the last two verses, 12 and 13, but it's not just joy generically speaking, but joy in the Lord and joy toward the Lord. Uh, He says, it's time for me to fulfill my vows toward the Lord of praises, or it could be translated thank offerings. Look at verse 12. Thy vows are upon me, O God. I will render praises or give thank offerings to you. Now, this makes sense to us if we're familiar with the Old Testament form of worship, particularly. So when men like David, Hebrew men, were facing dangers, they would pray to the Lord, Lord, deliver me, spare my life in this upcoming battle or in this situation. And if you should spare me so that I can survive... At the first opportunity, I will go to the temple in Jerusalem and I will offer up a thanksgiving offering and I will sing psalms of praise to you for hearing and answering my prayers. And time and again, they found out God did answer their prayers. God did save their lives. And when that happened, it's time to pay the vow. It's time to carry out what they promised God would do in the outcome of answered prayer. That's what's in view here. And making vows to praise the Lord or to give an offering in, in, as a thankful response to answered prayer is not inappropriate today. Thanksgiving, actually, and worship uh, is, is a spontaneous urge in the godly after answered prayer. There's, there's not too much in the Christian life that will make you feel delight and like you want to praise the Lord more than if you've been really scared about something. You commit it to the Lord and He hears your prayer and raises you up. You're going under the knife for surgery and they say, you have to have this if you're going to live, but there's only a 50% chance of survival. When you go through the surgery, you open your eyes on the other side. It's time to praise the Lord, isn't it? Of course. Mm -hmm. And Christians want to. It's right that we should praise the Lord for answered prayer. Remember the one leper out of the ten who turned back to give thanks uh, for being healed from leprosy. And I think there's implicit evidence in that story, the Gospels, that although all ten of them may have had faith to be healed from leprosy, only one of them had faith that saved his soul. And that was the one that turned back to thank God and thank Jesus for the miraculous cure. Well, verse 13 is the psalmist rehearsing the blessing he had received back to God. Now, this is the passage that 
in the King James appears in the second part as a question, but it may be actually just a declaration. Um, here's another translation of verse 13 that I think is worthy. For you rescued me from death, even my feet from stumbling, to walk before God in the light of life. He's just, this, is, this pleases God that we should tell him in our psalms of singing, in our prayers, we should just tell him the, the wonderful things that he has done for us, done for our souls. Lord, you're worthy of praise. I was lost and you found me. I was perishing and you rescued me. I was aimless and you directed my feet. I was full of fear and now I'm not. I'm, I'm trusting in you. And you, Lord, are to be praised for making the difference in my life. Amen. In other words, the Lord is a God for the fearful. And delivering us from our fears, he stirs our willing sacrifice of praise. Again, this psalm is sort of a microcosm and pattern of what true religion is. God is the Almighty, the capable, the Savior, the merciful. We are the sinful, weak, guilty, needy, fearful. We make our petitions to God. Have mercy upon us, Lord. We're undone except for you. God hears and answers our prayers and the rest of our lives. We're devoted to giving thanks and praise, worship as a response back to God. In all our fears then, let us trust in the Lord, even in Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Deliverer from all ills. Let us be encouraged and then respond to Him with praises. Amen? Amen. 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 That's the psalm. Psalm 56. I, I hope, I sincerely hope you understand it better now, that it means more to you, and that in the week, even the week to come, you will mull over what it says and make the practical applications in your own personal case.